Obviously, it's been a few years since you've held this in-person summit. The last time you and I talked was at the last time you held one in person in Beijing in 2019. A lot has changed. Why are you willing to go high profile as a major CEO of a company from America when others, they want to stay low profile and keep their heads low? How do you assess the U.S.-China relationship and the impact it's having on business? Okay, well, first of all, thrilled to be back again after all this time. And uh, you know, it's important for a CEO to visit their people and their clients around the world, you know, particularly in when you think time's a little more complicated, et cetera. But I think it's important for the viewership to understand there are like 3,000 investors here from around the world. There are hundreds of companies, of Chinese and non-Chinese companies, learning about uh, the world. We do research on 500 companies. That research circulates the world. And hopefully business could be a, you know, could be for good to help countries lift up. I have enormous respect for the Chinese people. The modernization of this country has been extraordinary. And yes, there are some very complex issues that have to be dealt with. At what point does Jamie Dimon have to become the diplomat? Look, Joe Biden has not spoken to Xi Jinping since November, the Bali meeting. Military to military discussions are, are being rebuffed and not even happening. Business to business is tenuous at best. What, what role can you and should you play while you're there? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I would look at it a little bit differently. So there are conversations that took place recently that you know, have been in the press, which I think are great. I mean, it's hard to resolve issues when you have the echo chamber in your own brain telling yourself what you already think. And I think business can be a force for good. But I, I don't represent the government, but you know, everyone knows I'm an American patriot. So I'm sitting here in China, but I'm a red-blooded full-throated, free enterprise capitalist. And, and so the governments have to talk. Every government has national security in mind and how do they, uh, how do they be, get better at national security. Uh, and I should point out is that this globe of ours has benefited from trade. You know, it's benefited from all these things taking place. And so uh, uh, it's lifted and even taken this country you know, they have benefited, I know there's criticism about the American global system, but that American global system has done an extraordinary, it's not American, you know, if you go to America, a lot of Americans will complain about NATO and WTO and WHO and the United Nations, but it's lifted up, look what it's done for China. I think that the global system has been fabulous for China, and they may have com complaints about it, just like the rest of us have complaints, but uh, um, I'm thrilled to be here again. You know, we have... You have to go see your people and thank your people for what they've done, particularly through this terrible time of COVID, which I think has done a lot of damage to the world in a lot of different ways. So uh, getting out is the right thing to do. Yeah, what is your calculus? Has it changed over these four years on how you want to expand in China? Obviously, you're fully licensed up now. You were very productive during the pandemic. Yeah. You got full JVs and full ventures in securities uh, and in mutual funds and futures. You're, 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 you're pretty much well established on the mainland, which was your goal. But the, the things have changed. China's not necessarily the be all end all anymore. We've had simultaneous crackdowns domestically on the platform economy, on property, on online gaming, on online education, not to mention COVID zero. You have a crackdown on consultancies. There's lots of pressure. I mean, are you recalculating your growth projection and the capability of that growth in China? You, you went through a long list there, which I wouldn't, may not wouldn't agree with all of it. But I think when, when we do visit a country, and we do visit 100 countries around the world, we are there for the citizens of the country. And we're there, hopefully, through good times and bad times. We tend not to leave other than there's war or civil war. And so we're not predicting any of that here. You know, obviously, it's become a far more complex situation. You know, for, some for good reason, some not for good reason. And, you know, there's risk. There's always going to be risk. And I think you'll see companies react to different things for different reasons. Some is their own resiliency. Some is obviously national security, you know, will trump all the other things. So, when, you know, our government tells us to do A, B, and C. We're going to do A, B, and C and, and support it. And I think there's, there's a risk in China itself that, you know, if you, the, the, I've met with several people here. If you have more uncertainty, some of it caused by the Chinese government, well, of course, it's going to not just change foreign direct investment, which I, has gone up I, a little surprisingly, and I don't think they should assume that's going to continue, but it's going to change the people here, their own confidence, their own ability to, to invest and do things. And so, uh, uh, like I said, if people have deep conversations, respect each other, engage properly, 
I think the American government said all the right things recently, which is, because you heard it from Treasury Secretary Yellen, you heard it from President Biden, you heard it from National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, you heard it from Secretary of State Tony Blinken, that this is not decoupling, this is de-risking, the world's changed a little bit. Obviously, they are concerned about the war in Ukraine. They should be. I think that's probably one of the most serious things affecting the future of the globe. And I mean the future of the globe for the next 50 years. And I think they're doing the right things. I'm completely supportive of that. And so, uh, you know, China is obviously going to do what they think is good for itself. And business might be a positive attribute. But, but national security will trump all our issues. Now, I was just at G7 where we heard a lot of that rhetoric where they're de-risking, not decoupling. Uh, but again, you know, the Chinese say it's one and the same. It's, it's America trying to limit China's rise. Uh, and, and you've seen that bifurcation. There's more jargon, not to, to overemphasize all this jargon that's going out there. But again, do you see de-risking being different from decoupling? Totally. I mean, look, you know, Steve, you got to look at the facts. Trade actually went up and, uh, last year, and, and I think de-risking means national security. You know, everyone's gonna de every country's going to determine it their own way. You know, now we're talking about very advanced chips. Well, that's kind of reasonable, you know, not to help non-allies have things that can help the military. You know, obviously, there are you know, rare earths and things like that, so America's going to look at that. They were very clear. They're talking about a, they, they used the word, you know, a small garden with high walls as opposed to everything. And let's, you know, we should hope that let's not make it everything. I think the business community is trying to help advise them on that. Then there's going to be companies doing things just for their own resiliency. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, too. And then there's the, the big one, which is also this constant negotiation about trade, unfair trade, free access, fair access. That's been going on with, for my whole life, which is about every country. And countries should learn about when they're legitimate concerns and when they're not legitimate concerns. And like listen to each other deeply and uh, uh, adjust accordingly. So if you ask me over time, yeah, there'll be less trade. You know, it'll take years for these things to take place, but it won't be a decoupling. And, and the world will go on. I think, like I said, I think far more important is what's happening in Ukraine right now. And so uh, hopefully this will sort out and it'll never sort out if people don't talk. So I urge people, let, have some real deep conversation, get to know each other a little bit, a little bit, each other's concerns about some of these issues and um, things would be better if we had that. Well, do you have these conversations as well? Because a lot of people uh, do try to extrapolate what's happening in Ukraine with the potentiality in East Asia with Taiwan. We know Warren Buffett has divested completely its investment, uh, Berkshire Hathaway's investment in Taiwan Semiconductor. There's nervousness, and that creates hesitancy for investment and fund flows, which are down, obviously. Trade deals are down. Do you see the direct correlation of the risks that are, have risen in East Asia uh, because of Taiwan, because of what's happening in Ukraine, uh, exacerbating that? You know, I think, you know, look, I'm not an expert on Taiwan, and I, I would defer to Bob Gates and Henry Kissinger about how to de-escalate that situation. And obviously it adds to the tension and things like that. Uh, but remember, this is a world issue. All the countries around the world would be concerned about Taiwan and the outcome of that. I think what Ukraine showed people is that the world wasn't safe, that you know, oil and gas supply chains aren't safe, food supply lines aren't safe. You know, everyone was starting to relook at what is national security. You had Germany importing, I think, it was half of their natural gas from Russia. So I think that did cause people to look at what are their alliances, what are their trade, what are the things. And obviously, it's causing a lot of confusion and a lot of issues, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll make a lot of progress on it. Like I said, that t comes with engagement. And that comes with, you know, with, the, yeah, with I don't both wanna... the American government and other folks, you know, sitting down. Yeah, I don't want to keep on harping on the negative side of it, but is there any scenario, the worst case scenario, that would make your investment and, look, it's a sizable investment in China, m make it untenable for you? You know, Steve, you're, you're, going, you're going to repeat yourself over and over. We're here. We're going to support the Chinese people, uh, the Chinese governments. We do business with a thousand companies here. Half are multinationals coming in, half are local companies. Uh, you know, we always have managed our risk that we can handle with almost whatever happens around the world. And I am an American patriot. 
I will do what my government tells me. I'm going to salute like anybody else. But I can tell them what I think. And you can imagine that I've been very clear when I sit down with them what I think and what we think matters. And like I said, a lot of the business community, I think, could be very helpful in that. This is not a simple matter. And sometimes we oversimplify things in a way which actually damage you know, the ultimate outcomes. Will you have an opportunity? Can you reveal whether you're going to meet with Li Chang, the premier, or any of the other senior Chinese leaders? And, and what would you like to get from them? I, I'm, I'm meeting with a very limited amount of Chinese leaders. I, I met with one, but I'll keep that conversation private. And uh, like I said, you know, I'm here for our people. I'm here for these clients. I think it's great that this is taking place. I think humanity is better off this type of thing. And obviously, national security will reign supreme. And so, but, the, but you don't stop doing one because of the other. And so, uh, I, like I said, I'm thrilled to be here. And it's amazing which I've, what I've seen take place in China over the last 25 years, partially because of the global system. And I think they, they should be clear about that. And, you know, they have their own problems here. You know, 20 percent unemployment in youth. I mean, that's a scary number. And so, you know, growth, they need growth, too. And confidence is very important for growth. When do you see cross-border deal-making picking up? It's been quite a, a nadir on that front. Cross-border between China and other people or just globally? Right. Well, let's, let's talk about China, say China, U.S., or outbound from China and the like. Outbound. You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think there are always a lot more conversations you think, and obviously it's been damped a little bit. I think America is still open for business. You know, Chinese companies are going to be a little concerned. You know, we've, we've had CFIUS for a long time now. But I would say we're still generally open for business. And if you're in a Chinese company and you want to do something, you know, tr look at it. Don't back off just because you're afraid of something and, you know, get some advice and help on how you can go about that the right way. But uh, America is still open for business. And I think you've heard that from Secretary Yellen, Secretary Blinken, uh, and all those. So we still believe in, you know, open and fairly free markets. Let's pivot to what's happening in the United States. Obviously, the debt ceiling impasse is coming to a head, perhaps with a House vote coming up uh, as soon as uh, later today or tomorrow, I believe. Uh, can you kind of tell me what your war room, your debt ceiling war room, is advising you on the unintended uh, consequences, A, of a default, or even B, uh, the, the ramifications, even if a deal is done in Congress, on, on whether that could mean, you know, higher rates as well as we head towards a possible mild recession. So I, I first of all, I think I think Kevin McCarthy, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, the president, uh, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, Mitch McConnell all did a great job. And I, I, I think it's great. This is this is democracy and bipartisanship. And I think they did the right thing. And I think it's going to happen. If I thought it wasn't going to happen, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Uh, so, and obviously, it's got to get through a couple of votes in Congress, and uh, our people are pretty comfortable it will happen. You know, I, I've been, we've been public for years. If, it, if you have an, an actual default, it's not good. You know, America, the financial system of America, the econo economy of America, it's still the most prosperous and largest economy the world's ever seen, the most innovative, the most growing, and the rest of the world relies on it. You know, so I think we shouldn't create any instability there. Uh, so I wish that one day we'd get rid of the whole debt ceiling thing. But I understand when, you know, it's a democracy. People have different opinions about what we should be doing. And it's just one tool for one party to, you know, get the other party to the table. So uh, I'm quite optimistic there. And I really do applaud the fact that they all sat down and spoke, got something done. What's your read on inflation on whether the Fed will go beyond the pause and hike again? <clears throat> you know, my... Simple view is that, you know, the, the, their right to pause at this point has been a big increase, you know, 500 basis points or so. Take a pause. But I do think it's possible they're going to have to raise a little bit more. That, you know, inflation is kind of stickier. I think people are coming around to that, which means rates may have to go up a little more. People should be a little prepared for that. You know, just, just as a matter of managing your own business, be a little prepared for that. Whether you're a financial company or a real estate company, et cetera. I think the other thing I'd be a little prepared for is the volatility that might very well be created by quantitative tightening. We've never really had quantitative easing, which we've had now for you know, the better part of 15 years. And now you're going to see quantitative tightening. And I think the effects may be a little harsher than people expect. But hopefully we'll get through all of that and I'll be okay. 
how would you assess the banking crisis, whether we're still facing a banking crisis? Uh, obviously, you, you come from a very interesting perch, having taken over a first republic. Do you see more pain coming down and what needs to be done on the regulatory front to prevent this from happening again? Yeah, so, so the first thing is, this is nothing like 08. There's nothing like that leverage in the system. The private, the private companies are in actually very good shape. But the banking system is in pretty good shape. You've seen regional banks just report very good numbers. The deposits didn't run out like people are talking about. This is nothing like that. There are a couple of banks that are offside. This, that offsides and interest rate exposure and, and uh, things like that, First Republic being one of them. We were asked by our government to step in, and we did, and we were able to handle it. I'm extremely proud. I hope Jen Peepsack and Marion Lake will look at me now, like what you all have done, get an airplane Sunday night to fly out, talk to the people. You know, obviously, it's a lot of work and, you know, uh, hard for people, but we're, we're trying to show real humanity, you know, using redeployment of anyone who loses their job is trying to find other jobs at J.P. Morgan or elsewhere. We had the capability to handle it. I think it's also a sign, by the way, because we totally support community banks. We totally support regional banks. I, I would be careful to take what regulations have to be done as opposed to supervision, uh, and we want them to do well. So I, I want to be very careful how people go about that. So these, this banking system, you know, we acknowledge that community banks do a lot of things we can't do. And so I think they're our critical part of the system, and, but so is the J.P. Morgan. You know, we bank small companies, large companies. We bank the IMF, the World Bank. We bank cities, stools, states, hospitals. We bank companies in 30 countries. You know, and so there's a reason that you have both large and small and uh, all different types. And so uh, yeah. I think we're over this part of it for the most part. There may be something else. But rising rates, if they get high enough, it can rear its ugly head again. And so I think, like I said, it's not just banks. People should be prepared for slightly higher rates than they've been used to in the past 15 years. Are there further redundancies necessary associated with First Republic? Uh, we knew we were going to get a plan from you guys by the end of the month. It's the end of the month. We know maybe 1,000 jobs cut, but there's 7,000 employees there. Uh, is there anything you can reveal on, on what further yeah. tightening is necessary as you integrate that bank? No, you know, the, I think the 1,000 was less than what they had planned to do on their own. And we need a lot of people. And, we, you know, we have a lot of, you know, we hire a lot of people each year. So I use the word redeployment. We're hoping that almost everyone who might lose their job, you know, and there might be some more, but almost everyone, we could say, hey, we have this other job for you in the same city, you know, or, or something like that. So, you know, we're pretty good at that, and hopefully we can pro provide opportunity. You know, we welcome the first, uh, first Republic people of the company. We're treating them with great humanity, I hope. We're going to learn a lot from them. You know, very often when you have to do a deal like this, you know, people are angry. We're not. I've never been part of a company. We didn't buy someone or merge with someone where you don't learn something from both sides. And so, you know, they have this right. wonderful wealth uh, business, you know, uh, in banking and wealth management. And, you know, we're, we, we have a few things to learn there to do. I mean, I've never seen, I've gotten so many emails from very happy customers. And that's a great thing. So what can we learn and what can we do better for J.P. Morgan Chase? Now, Jamie, I know last week you talked a lot about succession or about your position, that you're not talking about retirement right now. I do need to ask you, though, and your name has been bantied about for years about public office. I mean, I don't think Wall Street's too pleased about a potential Trump versus Biden runoff next year. Is it any, has that scenario ever crossed your mind that you would run for public office or even accept a cabinet position? You know, obviously it's crossed my mind because people mention things to you and stuff like that. You know, I love my country, and maybe one day I'll serve my country in one capacity or another, but I love what I do. I think J.P. Morgan can do a great job for helping Americans, for helping countries around the world, and this is my job. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm quite happy doing it. I still have the energy to do it. I mentioned, you know, that when you don't, I think people should give up the job. We've got a fabulous management team who I really enjoy working with, uh, um, so no, I'm here.